so for our first question, like, can everyone just give a brief, like, overview of, you know, who you are and what your career is? Of course. <laughs> um, my name is Stephanie Mabry, and my career path is called a medical laboratory scientist. It's actually very similar to the biochemistry pathway. Um, my education is really in all of the laboratory testing to evaluate human body systems. It's like if you've ever had a needle put in your arm and blood drawn out and sent to the lab, I'm the lab. I'm one of those people in the lab running all those scientific tests and generating that data. And so I work in a department called Special Chemistry and Toxicology at Beaumont Royal Oak. And I, I do hormone level testing. I do diabetic monitoring testing. I do testing relating to drugs of abuse and therapeutic drug monitoring. And I also uh, teach at Oakland University in their medical laboratory science program. I teach clinical chemistry and medical hematology, which is all about your blood cells. So I kind of have two paths within that career field. Wow, that's super cool. Okay, I'm Dr. Hiblin. Um, I'm a dentist here in Rochester. Um, I'm a general dentist, um, though I do lots of kinds of different things. Um, my office is actually in Livernoy, kind of right across from uh, Rochester High School. So yay, Falcons, if any of you are Falcons. Um, and I mean, you guys all know what a dentist is, but um, the cool thing is about being a dentist that I think is super cool is that it is like hard science. So you always are learning new things. Um, a lot of high tech stuff, um, lots of management, lots of business, um, which I always find interesting. A lot of psychology in it, marketing, you know, human resources management, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then it's like artistic stuff and very hands-on. So if you like to do things with your hands, if you're the person who always wants to do like craft projects and stuff like that, um, it's like that. So it's taking biology, especially kind of engineering, building things, fixing things, making things structurally sound and doing it every day all the time. So fun stuff. I think Stephanie and I both have actually interesting yeah. where we're like biology people, but we get to do things yeah. and doing things. Hands on, yeah. Long. That's yes. really drew me to the lab job is I don't just sit in front of a computer all day. I'm walking around, I'm doing things, I'm hands on. I, I need that activity. Same, same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's great to talk to you all, you guys, because I'm a medical laboratory scientist too. Oh, yeah, yeah, I work in the state of Michigan um, at the public health laboratory. A um, little different career path than what Stephanie has taken. I will just sort of give an overall of what a lab medical laboratory scientist is and does, but they're a professional and they perform routine and highly specialized laboratory tests. Um, they, they assist physicians in diagnosing disease um, and in disease monitoring and prevention, just like Stephanie has all mentioned. There's multiple areas of the laboratory. Um, there's clinical chemistry, special chemistry, like Stephanie mentioned. Um, there's hematology, which is your blood cells, blood bank, which is my happens to be my specialty, microbiology, coagulation, urinalysis, immunology. You can't be bored. <laughs> so the other point that I would just sort of bring out is that in, in 2018, approximately 14 billion laboratory tests were done in the, in the United States. So that's a lot of laboratory tests. And it's anticipated that those laboratory tests will increase 5 to 10% every year. So um, they estimate that 90% of all patients that are in a hospital have laboratory testing done. So to wrap it all up, I would say without the lab, diagnosing the disease it would just be a guess. Next question, we were wondering what um, the educational, like the requirements to get into your um, career job, your job, what the educational requirements are. So for medical laboratory science, um, there's actually a variety of routes that somebody can take to end up with a career in a laboratory. There's a two-year associate's degree path that would be lead to a job title called a medical laboratory technician. And then medical laboratory scientist, um, like what Mrs. Lenemans and I do, is typically a four-year bachelor's degree program, along with some sort of a clinical internship, actually following people in a laboratory, learning how to do the laboratory testing, sort of hands-on in a laboratory, an, an actual hospital laboratory. And so some programs, that internship is part of the educational program, and in um, others, the internship is after you graduate with your degree. So, but there's, there's other routes as well, but those are the, the two most common. 
Um, for mine, for being a dentist, you guys are probably pretty um, aware of it. Um, it's a lot like medical school. You do four years of undergrad. Um, some places like University of Detroit Mercy, they have a combined program where you can get, do like two or three years of undergrad and then you start doing your undergrad and your dental together. Um, but you do four years of undergrad. Um, you can actually get an undergrad degree in anything you want. Um, most people are biology, chemistry, biochemistry, something like that. Um, in reality, you can do, you know, all the requirements, which is a lot of biology, your physics, inorganic, organic chemistry, all that kind of thing. Um, and then actually get your degree in something else. Um, but uh, it really, you wanna to go to a major university, you wanna to try to do some um, research while you're an undergrad. If you're serious about going to medical school or dental school, try to get into some kind of research lab to work with a professor, which um, U of M has good things with that. Lyman Briggs at Michigan State, actually I'm a U of M undergrad, um, but Lyman Briggs at Michigan State has a really good program where you um, meet professors and you do research with them. So if you're thinking about medical school or dental school, seriously, look at that one. One, two. Um, and then you go to four years of dental school. And then if you want to specialize, you go on beyond that for like two to six more years. So it's a bit of a haul, but it's worth it. Definitely you have to like school because you're in it for a long time. Again, I would agree with Stephanie. You know, I got a bachelor's of science in, it was called medical technology at the time. Um, it's now called li clinical laboratory scientists or other names might be medical laboratory scientist or biomedical laboratory scientists, all about the same thing. And I, again, um, it, in my route, I had to get my bachelor's and then I um, took a year of accredited internship and you have to pass a national registry if you want to practice. So that's another piece, at least in the clinical, in the clinical laboratory. And then I also, you can go on and you can specialize after that. I worked for about six years and then specialized in blood banking or transfusion medicine. So, you know, Stephanie was right. There's all different kinds of education levels and it's the education levels in the hospital that give you, um, that determine what level of testing you're going to do. Um, Stephanie and I would have the opportunity to do um, the highest level of testing, whereas someone who um, only has an associate's degree probably would not have that opportunity. So that, that sort of describes the, the educational requirements. Uh, thank you. Um, could you walk us through what like a typical day looks like, like what activities are involved for you each day? So um, my day uh, really depends on what testing I'm scheduled to do for the day. Um, if I'm working in toxicology, I might have only a few laboratory tests to do, but they all are very long protocols that will take a lot of manual. We use something called pipettes, which use, um, I don't know, are you familiar with pipette? <laughs> I guess I should have thought of how to describe this a little bit better. Um, but they're basically trigger action suction devices that will suck up sample and dispense it into another um, container. And so we do a lot of that. So it's a lot of that hands-on. If I'm doing something that's maybe um, like hemoglobin A1C, which is a test for monitoring glucose control in patients with diabetes, we do thousands of those. And so that's more of making sure I can go find all of the samples and get the samples that might be shared with another department. And so I'm talking to my coworkers in hematology about, do you have samples for me? My coworkers in um, chemistry, do you have samples for me? And so that's more walking around and interacting with other departments. And so it really kind of depends. There's, there's so many different things that you can do, at, at, you know, as we both kind of mentioned. Um, some laboratories, you work in just one department, like I, Beaumont Royal Oak is very big. Um, the state of Michigan lab, I'm sure, is very big. And so we work in really one specialized sort of area. But in smaller labs, you might be doing everything. You might be matching up blood for a surgical patient down in the OR at the same time that you're working up a urine culture for a urinary tract infection for another patient at the same time. You're answering the phone and telling somebody what a positive COVID, COVID antibody test means. So it's a lot of multitasking. And what the, th there really is no typical day. And that's kind of the enjoyment of it. Mm -hmm. Um, 
another person with, you know, not necessarily a typical day also. And um, you, you can tell all three of us are people who like to do things. And, you know, as a dentist, some of you guys all kind of know what dentists do. Um, we're drooling, we're working with our hands, which I love. If you don't like doing that kind of thing, run as far away as you can, as fast as possible. Um, you, as a dentist, if you're um, running your own practice, um, you can set up your day however you want. You can be like, I want it really relaxed and calm and, you know, sort of take your time. Or you can be like, I want to make lots of money. I want to run around and be really busy. And then you can do that. Um, I like being, you know, really busy when I'm there. So we're like working. But we always have lots of fun, too. And it's talking with lots of people like, um, you know, I probably see most kids more than you probably see your dentist more than you see your pediatrician um especially if we're like doing braces on a kid or something like that i mean we get to know everyone and we know our families and you know we see people we see all of you guys from the time you're like your moms are carrying you in until you're heading off to college and then finally when you get married and move away then you know we're like oh bye okay um but it's great you know we see we talk to people all day long i have great stories to tell from people that i hear all day long really interesting things doing things with our hands and that's like business stuff too you know however much you want to get involved with the business and marketing and employees and all that you do that too and then we sit down and we listen to music and we eat cake and do whatever else we want to do so mm -hmm. my normal work day is definitely different than stephanie's i work in the outreach area i do not work in the laboratory any longer um, i'm in the administrative area so with the state lab outreach supports education and biosafety and preparedness activities for um, the state and the Bureau of Labs. So I'm part of a team that specializes in preparedness activities such as biosafety and bioterrorism and chemical threats. Um, I also administer, it's called Explore Lab Science. It's our outreach science education for K-12. And the goal of the program is to do introduce um, students to laboratory science and public health as a career. Why? Because we recognize that there are shortages now and there's going to be shortages in the future. So we try to get as much information out there as we can um, about our careers, hoping to encourage people that they could at least see it as a career option. Um, the other piece that I do that's really hot and heavy right now is I participate in the Community Health Emergency Co coordination Center, we call it the CHECK, C-H-E-C-C. And that was activated with COVID-19. And the CHECK is Michigan Department of Health and Human Services Emergency Coordination Center. So similar to like the state police or if there's a big disaster, any requests for anything COVID come in through this CHECK. And I serve as um, the lab liaison there. So I work with what the state, the CHECK needs and what the laboratory can do and produce, which we probably, I probably should stop for a sec and define the difference between a clinical hospital laboratory and public health. I didn't start in public health till about four years ago. And it's been fascinating to me. I've learned a ton, um, but public health deals with a whole community, the health of a community, as opposed to in the hospital laboratory, you're dealing with a patient, a physician and a patient and their relationship and diagnosing that specific disease. Whereas in public health, I, I think of it as a 10,000 foot view. They actually back up and look at the community as a whole and the community may be defined as a city or a country or a state or the world. Um, COVID being a good example of a public health threat, but you know, there's also, also flu and HIV and tuberculosis. Those are all public health issues. Public health stuff. Wow. Cool. That is, I know, <laughs> public health stuff is pretty cool. Well, I had never done it before. So I had been in um, a more clinical lab setting um, for most of my career and then had the opportunity to jump over to public health. And it has been, I've learned so much. I didn't know who did all of the bioterrorism training for the state of Michigan or who did the chemical fact threat training or just even being in the check. Boy, I tell you, when somebody says at one point in time, with COVID testing, we needed a refrigerated semi so we could store extra specimens. 
the, I made the request through the check and I'll tell you what, two hours later, it was pulling into our parking lot. So it, it was, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool how it works. Yeah, that is pretty cool. Wow. Like, I was going to ask, too, um, how have your careers, like, adapted with the pandemic since last year? Like, especially because you talk about having to be hands-on. Like, what was that like? Yeah, so um, being in the hospital laboratory was a very unique phenomenon. It was something unlike I've ever seen before. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of jobs that are open in the clinical laboratory right now. There's actually a big workforce shortage. And so we're busy. We're running around all day, every day. And when all non-emergency healthcare was shut down, all of a sudden there was no hemoglobin A1Cs to do. I would do a thousand on a busy day. Now I was doing 10. And so it was really kind of strange. But within about a couple of weeks, things started opening back up. And now we're, we're really busy again. We had to develop all of the COVID molecular testing, the, the PCR tests that you hear about, the swabs that get stuck up your nose in a parking lot. Those swabs all come to us and we actually do this, the testing of those. Um, we had to work up COVID antibody testing. And by work up, I mean, do all of the research that shows that, that yes, that test works the way it's supposed to in our laboratory. So we were very, very busy in that regard. Um, of course, just kind of regular things like wearing masks. Um, we have to do sort of these forms that, that say that we don't have coughs or runny noses or fevers when we come into work for the day. Kind of those sorts of things are, are minor changes. But it's been very interesting for me to watch the response to the COVID pandemic because I was actually part of the Ebola patient care team that was put in place back when the Ebola pandemic was really big. Um, I was one of four laboratorians at Beaumont Royal Oak who was trained to do any laboratory testing on an Ebola patient if we were to get one. And so that was much more focused on all of the PPE. Um, we had to wear double gloves, double gowns, booties, hats, caps. And so that was kind of the unique factor there as opposed to this, which is just this massive onslaught of testing. So much testing that we're, we're struggling to keep up with it. Um, in the dental world, um, we got hit full on. I mean, we are, when you look at the most dangerous jobs, the top three are dentists, dental hygienists, and anesthesiologists. So yay, that was us. Um, we got shut down for three months, which was the right thing to do because everything was so unknown. Um, we just had to shut down, which meant I wasn't getting paid our office. I mean, just, this has never happened before, but you know, you have to be ready to roll with it, which is where kind of the business side came in. I mean, every day I was on, you know, epidemiology and infectious disease webinars. And this is where your science really comes in, where you have to evaluate everything coming in. You're like, what are we going to have to do to be able to reopen and reopen safely for um, our staff and our patients and everything? Um, so it was kind of like when I first started, I first started in dentistry, I was in school right after HIV and AIDS became a big thing. I know you guys have always been, it's always been there since you've been around, but it was like a huge thing. And before that, dentists didn't wear gloves. They put their hands right in people's mouths, like spit and blood and everything. They touched everything, which is so disgusting to me because um, I came around after that. And you guys are like, oh my God, I would never stick my hands in someone's mouth. Yet they did all the time. You would put their finger in blood and like swirl it around. Unreal. So this is kind of like the next thing is like that became bloodborne pathogens where everyone was like blood and saliva, watch out. Now it's airborne. Um, we call it um, uh, aerosolized respiratory um, particles. And now it's like, and we're getting hit with it all the time because it's everything that's coming out of the respiratory tract and it's spraying all over us. So we put in a big investment in all kinds of stuff like air purifiers and um, PPE, N95 and face shields. Um, so the things that are in place now kind of are like, it was always kind of gross. Like we didn't go home and wash our hair because we had all kinds of crap in our hair always yet we didn't come home and wash our hair. So now we like basically take a, like a biohazard shower when we leave. Um, and that's kind of stuff that we'll, we'll continue to do. But yeah, we changed pretty dramatically, but you know what, all this stuff, you learn the new stuff. It's like, meh, okay, now it's completely normal to us. I wouldn't think about not wearing all the PPE and, and being near anyone. It's like, eh. So. For myself, and I'm sure Stephanie was the same way. I mean, we were in the laboratory, the medical laboratory considered essential health workers. So we didn't get an opportunity to get closed down. Um, we were considered essential workers. And in the laboratory, just to begin with, 
we're all used to working with infectious substances. So of course we have masks and respirators and we're protective, um, personal protective equipment all the time. And we have hoods and biosafety level rooms just to um, work on certain specimens and our laboratory in general has good ventilation. But with the, ad, with the advent of COVID, of course, we became all that more um, cautious about what we did. You know, before you walk out of the laboratory, of course, your lab coat has to come off and you wash your hands. And everyone, was, everyone is very um, concerned about um, whatever imprint they might leave when you walk in the break room, everybody sprays down where we've been and we limit the people in our break room. So we've done those kinds of things too. These are all really cool jobs. Um, Every day is an adventure. It is. Yeah, it sounds like it. I like, I like, I'm listening about the hands-on, all the hands-on stuff you guys do. It's really cool. Um, has technology changed at all since you've begun your job and have you had to like adapt to it or like learn um, more to make it more effective? I would say for sure in, in our field, um, technology is always changing. There's always better instrumentation to use. Um, a lot of our laboratory tests are um, not necessarily like what you might do in a high school chemistry lab, add you know five milliliters of this fluid to five milliliters of this fluid, but they're run on these big sophisticated analyzers, big, big instrumentation. And so we're kind of part scientist, part healthcare provider, part engineer because we have to fix those machines when they go down, which means every time we get a new machine, we have to learn how it works and figure out how all the pieces go together and, and all of that. And so that's always changing. Um, but from a computer standpoint also, we're always getting new computer programs for um, either our laboratory test resulting that would interface. If you've heard of something called um, an electronic medical record, an EMR, that's all of the patient's medical information that's in a computer program, basically, a specialized computer program. And then every couple of years or so, those programs get updated. And then we have to go to classes and learn how to use the new computer program. And so it's, it's always changing all the time. And, and it, we do, we go to special classes to keep up on it. We go to special classes to learn how the instrumentation works. And it's, it's fun, I like it. Yeah, and with uh, dentistry too, I mean, I remember when I started, they said, you know, like every 20 years, everything will completely change that we do, especially because we deal so with much with materials. Now it's technology, it's um, CAD CAM, it's, um, it's, we're about to move into 3D printing, but materials change all the time. Now it's more like probably every eight to 10 years, everything completely changes, which is kind of fun because then it's all like new. It's not the same thing all the time. Um, you use a lot of your like basic science knowledge to kind of filter through and evaluate things. Say like, is this good or is this bad? Should I switch to this? I mean, it's an enormous amount of choices that you have to make. And it's all, um, a lot of it's like building kind of things and, you know, making things structurally sound. So, um, it's evaluating a lot of things and deciding what the right thing to use is and sometimes you make the right choice and sometimes not. Um, but yeah, everything changes all the time, but it keeps it fun. It really keeps it fun. It keeps you on your toes. I would support what Stephanie had to say. Um, technology has most definitely been probably the largest change in the laboratory. Technology has allowed for more efficient testing and increased testing capabilities. You can do more fat tests in less amount of time, so your turnaround is faster. Um, in fact, molecular methods like um, PCR, as Stephanie mentioned, probably a lot of what Stephanie mentioned didn't even exist when I first started. So um, technology has changed it tremendously and has allowed us to do a lot more um, tests. It used to be when instruments came in, I mean, instruments used to be really large and big, and now they're much more compact and small, so you can put more instruments in a laboratory. Um, to me, technology has probably been the biggest change in medical laboratory science over the years. And even, even within medical laboratory science, I have a number of former coworkers who have actually moved into IT. They, they started out with a laboratory science background, and now they work for IT for the hospital, helping to build those computer programs that house the medical records because they know how that information 
like that very specialized medical information needs to fit together and how it needs to be visible for physicians to use it effectively. And so um, it's really a, a nice pathway even to a technology, a more technology focused career more specifically. Uh, do you, Ali, I just wondering, do you still use like the regular microscope or do you oh, use yeah. the electronic ones that you have to like? Nope, we use regular microscopes. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I teach hematology at um, Oakland University. And that's a class where we really look at all of the different blood cells. And, and in our laboratory class, we literally look at them. We look at them under microscopes and what shapes are they? What colors are they? And what does that tell us about our patient? And that's things that instruments can guide us what we should be looking for, but it still takes a, a scientist with large amounts of experience and being able to assess the nuances of those cells to look at them. Um, microbiology uses microscopes a lot also to look at various bacteria and yeast and fungus. And we use different stains to stain them different colors and identify them. And so microscopes are a, a really big part of our, our job. Those aren't going away anytime soon. Yeah, some labs do have, um, they're, they're kind of expensive and they're not perfect, but some labs do have um, microscopes that will show a picture on a screen of, of what the, the image is on the slide, as opposed to having your eyes right up to the oculars. Um, but it still doesn't replace actually looking through those oculars and using your fine focus to really try to look at the three-dimensional shapes of things. Um, some labs have actually rules that identification of cells and bacteria and fungus can't be made on pictures. You're not allowed to take a picture and send it to somebody and get an ID. You have to actually look at it through the microscope to make that identification. That's pretty cool. How and why did you choose your careers that you chose? And like, did you know from a young age, like what you did or didn't want to do? And did that influence your decision? I actually didn't. I changed career paths probably numerous times throughout my childhood and high school. Um, when I was in high school, for the majority of my high school career, uh, I wanted to work in a fish hatchery. And so I was going to go to Lake Superior State for fisheries and wildlife management. I loved fish. I worked at PetSmart. I took care of the fish at PetSmart. Um, I bred fish. I had nine fish tanks in my room. I was a fish person. <laughs> I was going to work in a fish hatchery. Um, but I kind of started, you know, graduation was right around the corner and I started to get kind of nervous like do I really want to live six hours away from all of my family and all of my friends and most of my friends were going to Oakland University and I said you know something in healthcare would probably be a more stable job anyways so maybe I'll go to Oakland and I'll do something healthcare related and so I actually started out pre-pharmacy because I knew I really liked science and I didn't really like math. I don't know, sorry if people here really, really like math, but I didn't really like math. And so I felt like pharmacy was a good fit. I really liked chemistry and a little bit of biology. And I also knew that I wasn't really a good people person. I didn't have very strong social skills. And so I didn't wanna go into something like nursing. And so I started out pre-pharmacy. And as I started going through the pre-pharmacy program, I started thinking, well, what if I don't get into pharmacy school? What will I do with my pre-pharmacy degree if I don't get into pharmacy school? And so my academic advisor convinced me to switch my major to medical laboratory science because it would meet all the prerequisites for pharmacy school. Um, we take immunology, organic chemistry, pre-calculus, statistics, um, biochemistry, all of those classes. And with, with the idea that I could work in a laboratory if I didn't get into pharmacy school. And I got into these lab classes I mean, all of these really nuanced human physiology classes about how the body works and how disease happens in the body. And I loved it. I loved it so much. I, I just stayed a medical laboratory science person and that I kind of fell into it. And I, I'm so glad it happened. Yeah, I was not, um, looking back, I, I was sort of all over the place. I, you know, things that I like, um, I like creative fields. I thought about like advertising, marketing. I like travel. I thought, you know, should I do like languages and be like a foreign service, like, you know, in national security or, or things like this, like all over the place. Um, business, all of that. Um, my dad was actually a professor of anatomy and physiology. Both my brothers are physicians. My mother is a nurse. I was absolutely not going to do anything like everyone else was. 
um, in healthcare and the sciences. And so when I went to U of M, I wrote down that I was going to be an econ major. And then I never took a single class in economics. I don't, didn't even really know what it was. I don't know why I wrote that down. And then when I went through the um, course catalog, I was like, ooh, a microbiology class. Ooh, a parasitology class. Those sounded, those are what grabbed me and pulled me in. Um, and like Stephanie, I just, I love science. I, I love biology, especially physics. Ugh. I mean, I got through it because I had to, but oh, kill me. Um, Too much math. Too much math. Know, okay, whatever. I can get through chemistry, but it doesn't thrill me like that. Um, but biology, just love it. And so, you know, then honestly, I just started to think about like, and this is sort of, you know, something to think about. Um, my dad as a college professor always says to his students, don't think about what you want to do. Think about also where you want to live and how you want to live. Like what's your work-life balance? Um, don't go into like high finance if you don't want to live in New York City, you know, in a big city and work, you know, 80 hours a week. Um, think about what kind of work-life balance you want to have, how you want to be as a parent with kids, um, where you want to live. And, you know, when I kind of went through all my stuff, I was like, you know what, I want to live a nice life. My brothers as physicians, they're hospital-based based for excuse me, physicians, they work a million hours, mostly because they want to and that that clicks the boxes for them. Um, I wanted to have a nice work-life balance. I wanted to travel a ton. I wanted to do um, charitable work, which I work um, in Guatemala a lot. Um, I'm really involved with that in a public health um, down there. Um, I travel lots all over the world just for fun. I do backpacking trips. I ski. Um, I work three days a week, you know, when my kids were young, um, but I wanted to be a doctor. That was really important for me and really important in my family. Um, I'm not the person that's the best about like be being under someone. I'm better as the boss because I'm kind of a bossy sort of person. Um, so for me, I guess I have a problem with authority, but I wanted to be the boss, which some days sucks, but most of the days is great because if anything's crummy in my job in my life, well, it's my fault and I can fix it. So I liked being the boss. I wanted to be a doctor. I didn't want to be a physician. I love doing things with my hands. I looked around my hometown and I was like, who lives a good life around here? And I looked at the orthodontist. I'm like, that orthodontist has it going on. You know, he's a happy guy. He has horses. He has a huge house. You know, he is obviously raking in the buck. So I thought I was going to go into orthodox and I actually like general dentistry, but you know what, do whatever you want, but figure out like how much money you want to do, um, how much money will make you happy. Um, I like a lot of money. So, you know, that it makes a, that I make a good bit of money. Honestly, it makes me happy that I can go on trips and not have to worry about it. Um, but I get to help people, which sounds so trite, but I like to help people. Um, I liked, I like to be with people all day long and talk to them and hear their stories and then have an interesting story to tell when I come home. So for me, that was a plus, but if you don't like, you know, that kind of thing, then don't go into a career where you have to do that. Um, but there's lots of, there's lots of things you can do, you know, and you don't have to figure it all out now. Nobody has it figured out. Everyone goes freshman year. By the time you're coming home for Christmas, freshman year of college, um, you've changed your major usually. And then you change it again, usually before junior year. And that's fine. I think if you just, just sort of go like, I like the sciences and maybe something healthcare, then you get there and then you realize there's 10 million things you can do in that field. Or if you're like, you know, just sort of like go for a broad thing, but think about what will make you happy. And one thing with dentistry too, that I really liked was I could live anywhere. Cause I'm like, do I want to live in New York city or do I want to live on a ranch in Wyoming? Do I want to live at the beach or I didn't know. And I could still, I could go anywhere, small place, big place, top of a mountain desert, anywhere in the world. And they're going to need my um, services. So, you know, think about what makes you happy and what you need, because you can see that all of us are really enthusiastic about our jobs, um, which means we made good choices about what we needed to make us happy in a job. How did I choose it? And in what age? I was lucky enough to have parents who suggested that I go down this path. Um, I liked, at the time I graduated from high school, I liked healthcare and I loved science, loved chemistry, love, I love the human body. The human body is one of the most fascinating, it is the most fascinating thing in the entire world, um, how it works and how everything all works together. So I started down the path as a medical laboratory scientist and basically never turned back. I mean, I've done other things in my career. You know, I've gotten a master. I specialize in blood banking and stuff like that. But it's always somehow always comes back 
to lab science. And when I talk to other students, because um, I have some interns I work with, some are MLS students, some are not, but they've usually fallen into medical laboratory science because they couldn't find anything else that fit. So I, I always like to, I, I think it's my goal to let people know that medical laboratory science exists and it's there and it's a good career, not as, um, oh, it's not as patient intense as other um, professions are. But when you think healthcare, a lot of times you just think nurses and doctors yeah. And even beyond lab science, there are so many opportunities in healthcare, depending on what you think you would like to do that, you know, you just have to get started and you can change as you go along the way. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's really something to remember. It's like when you're in high school, like everyone's thinking like five things and your parents are thinking like five things like teacher, doctor, lawyer, engineer, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, maybe nurse, PT, you know, OT. It's like, that's what everyone's thinking. There, when you get to college and start talking to other people, you'll realize that's like the tiniest fraction of a percent of 1%. And then there are so many careers that you have never heard of that, you know, so just don't worry. You don't need to get it dialed in completely right now. Nobody really does. Um, but there are so many careers out there that you have no idea even exist. I definitely agree, like, especially um, at school, we do have, like, career planning where you, like, take all these quizzes and see, you know, what you're most interested in, but I definitely feel at school, like, especially with APs, like, the push to keep taking these advanced placement classes, sometimes you lose, like, your own interest, you know, like, you learn about so many things, like, at once, and you have to, like, memorize it, and then put it on the test, take the exams. But I don't really think like it really allows us to grow in our interests, you know, when you have to keep moving on. Okay, here's one thing about AP classes though. And this is something I realized with my kids is that um, um, at Rochester, and they were at Rochester High School, um, they graduated a few years back. But one of them, I was like, I was the mom who was like, you wanna go into like, the, you know, biochemistry, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And, he took AP biology his junior year um, with Mr. Kelly, is that who teaches it there? Who was a great teacher and he said it was a great class. He did really well in it. And, but the thing is, is that he realized, and I was like, it, I, and I always told him it was the most important AP class he took because that's like taking a, an AP class is like taking a college level class. And if you love it, then you consider going into that. And he's like, mom, I didn't love that enough to make that a career. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and now he works in Washington, DC and he's getting his master's in you know, foreign policy and national security. And of course that's what he should have gone into because he loved his government classes. He loved his world history classes. He loved all that stuff. That was him. He was so excited and inspired about it. Um, so sometimes the AP class that you take that you're like, oh, okay, that was all right. You know, I got an A grade, I did well, but it didn't speak to you. That's the most important class you ever had. That's the most important internship you have. The one that you go, oh, I don't love this. <laughs> that you can just take it off the table right there. Another one of my sons, I made him take um, AP environmental science. Um, I was like, just take an AP class, your science class. And he was not that kind of person. It, and who is it, Mr. Scherter? Yeah, Mr. Scherter. Changed his life. <laughs> I mean, changed his life. Now he's like um, working out in like the outdoor industry out in the Pacific Northwest. He is all environmental science, you know, environment, everything, vegan, blah, blah, blah. I mean, totally changed his life and he didn't want to take it. So those AP classes, you know, whether they really speak to you or whether you're like, oh, God, kill me, that tells you a lot. And a lot of a lot of students, I think, who are like, I'm pre-med and go off to college and they're like, I'm pre-med and I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon and then end up being psychology majors could have saved themselves all the agony if they'd taken AP biology um, in AP chemistry in high school and realize this isn't for me, you know, just take the, it gives you a taste of college and whether it's for you or not. So stick with the, the APs are important. They really are. But yeah, you're right. Sometimes it's pushing, 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 but you don't need to make every decision now. I think it's tough when you 
are in high school, because I certainly went through it with my kids, there's such an expectation that at the age of 18, you're going to know exactly what it is you want to do. And, mm -hmm. it, and it doesn't work that way. And in fact, you may have multiple careers in your lifetime and go back to school. I mean, life is all about learning. Um, I would be very disappointed if I didn't keep learning in my life. But, um, I, you know, I think you look at your interests and what you think you'd be good at and you take a step forward and you move in a direction. And if it ends up being the wrong direction, then you change. Yeah, exactly. You just say, oh, no, okay, not it. And you know what, remember too, it's like when you're in high school, especially I see like in the high schools now, do you guys feel like there's so much about like career, career, career and, you know, mm -hmm. college, you know, making decisions. And the reality is, is that you're job is your job and it's a career and it's a way to make money and if you get like happiness and fulfillment from it you know great you know but your life is your life you know so make sure whatever you do is like a part of your life but it doesn't have to be everything it's when you're in high school you think like your college career you know and then your career is it is a hundred percent of your life it's not it's not yeah, especially being a junior in high school, they like push, 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 like career and colleges and everything and everything just piles and piles and piles on. It's like crazy yeah. how much. Test yeah. scores, ah, oh, you're going to your life, right? I remember <laughs> taking those surveys, right? Like, would you rather build a birdhouse or read a book? Would you rather, yeah. right? And then it tells you what you're supposed to be. And mine came back that I was supposed to be either a truck driver or a lumberjack. <laughs> Oh, I was a, I was a forest ranger, which I was like, I came home. I'm like, mom, it says I should be a forest ranger. My mom went rip, rip. No, you're not. I was a forest ranger or um, a hairdresser. And my son now who is, um, who's getting his master's degree in like uh, international relations. National, I don't even, I, I don't even know what he does. Something in Washington, DC with the international world. Um, and it said that he should be either a hairdresser or a prison guard. And I was like, did they ask if you want to carry a gun at work? Cause he would have been like, yeah. So yeah. yeah I think <laughs> what what I, are weird. <laughs> I think what I took out of it was it, it had highlighted the fact that I, I wanted to be doing something. I wanted to be working with my hands. I didn't want to be sitting at a computer writing all day. I would have probably hated being like a journalist. Um, yeah. Those kinds of things. I needed to be moving and doing. And yeah. so it, yeah, it, it you, picks up on some you, interests, but it's not necessarily yeah. the most important. I think. Yeah, and think about like, you know, do you want to work in, because I honestly, I mean, corporate America, especially for women, we're all women here. So corporate America, there's a lot of weird bullshit out there for, you know, with women. So I, you get into healthcare and it's better. Um, sciences are better. Um, but th kind of think about where in the like infrastructure and in the, you know, patriarchy you want to fall. Um, there's some of you said that if you can be the boss, if you want to be the boss, sometimes you're like, I want to go to work and, you know, do my job and let someone else be the boss and run things. But sometimes you're the person who's like, I'm going to be happiest if I'm the boss, you know, figure out where you fall in all of that and how you actually want to live your work life. And you may not know that at the age of 18, it may take a few more years before you yeah. work on figuring all that out. So until you have a really dad boss. Yeah. And then you say, you know what? I could do better. I want to be the boss. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I think I want to be the boss. I like being the boss. I would love to own my own business. And I yeah. like that. I go to work. I clock in at 2 30 PM. I clock out at 11 PM and I don't have to think about work again until I come back the next day at 2 30. So everybody has their, their interests and their skill sets. And that's what makes the world go around. Yeah. And, and that is it is that it's, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no, you know, it, it's, it's what's right for you. It's not, you know, is red or blue a, a better color? It's whichever one you prefer. Um, and Estella, you know, being the boss is great, you know, and you get to control things. But there are some days when I go through like the, a McDonald's drive through and I'm like, I just wanted to be the drive through person whose only job is just to say, do you want fries with that? Because that would be like, <laughs> wonderful sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's tough to be the boss, but yeah, it's like, you know, you either revel in it or you don't. And it's whatever is right for you. Yeah. Um, I was just uh, wondering, did money play a role at all in like what your job career or did you just kind of go more into it because you love the field? I mean, I just... So I, I, 
pretty much went into it. I would say that money played a role for me in the sense that I knew that whatever path I went, I wanted to have a job. It wasn't necessarily a difference between is the job 60,000 or 80,000, but will I have a job? And so the idea of getting this fisheries management degree where there wasn't necessarily a job waiting for me made me really nervous. And so I'd say money played a role in that regard that I, that's why I decided I wanted something in healthcare because um, you know, healthcare jobs are never going away. You know, like um, was mentioned, you can go to a top of, I can go to Hawaii. I see job postings in Hawaii all the time. I see job postings in Alaska. I can go anywhere and have a job. And so I really wanted job security, maybe more so than the exact number on the paycheck. Yeah. You know, and, and I grew up in a family that back when professors didn't make a lot of money, um, we didn't have a lot of money. I grew up poor. Um, I've been poor and I was like, yeah, I'd rather have money. And honestly, I mean, if, if there's two jobs, I'm like, they look equally fun and they fill all the things I will take the one with more money. Cause honestly, God, I like having money. That's just me. Um, but it lets me do things. It lets me, you know, travel to Guatemala and do my charitable work. It lets me travel around the world. It lets me do other things, you know, in my life that I want to do. And it lets me help people too. I can um, take care of my staff really well and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, all of us here in Rochester, we're all used to a good lifestyle. Um, I like it. I like having money. Money is fun. You can have fun with money. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so think about, you know, what is it? Do you want just a little job? Are you like, and I know everyone says like, if I'm doing something I love, then I, money doesn't matter. The money kind of matters. It kind of does, you know, and it's easy for everyone here in Rochester to say that because everyone has a good bit of money compared to the rest of the world, but I like having money. So yes. <laughs> and don't, and if, that's, if that sounds really shallow. No, it doesn't. I'm like money. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I, I um, certainly wanted to make enough money. My goal was to make enough money to be happy and survive, be able to support. I was raised by depression era parents who very much instilled in me that as a woman, a female, you know, if your husband leaves you or if your husband passes away, how are you going to support that family? So my goal has always been to make sure whatever I did, I made enough money that I could live happily and comfortably, including my family into that. So that was sort of my, my, um, my motivation. You look at Maslow's hierarchy of need, which I don't know if you guys have learned that yet in school. He was a psychologist and, um, oh, he sort of has this pyramid and the very bottom of the pyramid is where um, your basic needs get taken care of. And when you get past your ba basic needs, which in part, some of that is money, then you can start moving up the scale to the point where you actually have self-actualization and realization and life is great and good and all that stuff. And you don't need money anymore. But, you know, we sort of talk about money and you have to have enough money to be comfortable and to live and survive. And yeah. Yeah. Money's an evil, but it's a necessary one. <laughs> um, is there a lot of, I know Dr. Um, I, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong, Dr. Hib Hiblin? It's Hiblin, yeah. Hiblin? Is there a lot of um, traveling with any of your jobs? Um, you know what, with, with my job, you know what, and that's one of those things, with, with pretty much any job that you pick, in a way, you can decide how you want to live it. Um, I could be like a locum, I think they call them locum tenants, you know, dentists, where I could say, you know, I'm going to travel all over. I could go anywhere and, you know, and work. Um, but the, the one thing about um, being a dentist and owning a practice, and, you know, as soon as you get into your own business, is that that kind of cemented me here in this community, which is a great thing. But then when my husband, who's an engineer for General Motors, was like offered positions in China or in Germany or in Australia, well, we couldn't go or, or we chose not to go because that would mean putting my practice on hold and I make more money than he does. And, and I like what I do. Um, so we chose not to. The trade-off is, is that if I want to go, you know, for three weeks to Hawaii every year, you know, I usually go on three major trips a year, um, you know, for like two weeks at a time. I can take off however much time I want to take off. I don't get paid for that, but I can do whatever I want. Um, and then I go to Guatemala a few times a year to work because that's just something that I like. 
and I go down there and work. Um, so, you know, you can do whatever you want, but being a business owner does kind of glue you. Hi, Desmond, does kind of glue you in a, in a certain community for better or worse. Have you been able to go to Guatemala this year at all because of COVID or no? No, um, I was not. I was supposed to go just as it was breaking out um, and wasn't able to go. But um, now I'm fully vaccinated and I should be able to go in November. Um, I should be back down there again in November. So I'm super excited because I miss the team that I work with there. And they got, man, they got hit hard because they had like, um, they had, you know, lots of hunger issues. They had COVID and they can't deal with it. They won't get vaccines until like 2023 at best. They're like two years out from vaccines. And then they had, they got hit by back to back, like one week after another hurricane. So um, people that I work with down there are really hurting. Nothing like us here. It's, it's been a bad year. So I'm excited to get back down there. The amount of traveling in medical laboratory science really depends on which direction you take your career. Kind of the, the nice thing about medical laboratory science is, you know, we all start out doing that, that what we call bench level, doing laboratory testing on patients. And then a lot of people do move up and either specialize in one department, they take on managerial roles, but some medical laboratory scientists actually end up working for the companies that make the instrumentation. And so they go around to different hospitals around the country training other people how to use the instrumentation or fixing the instruments. And so those jobs would have a lot of travel. Um, I work just a, a permanent lab job at Beaumont and a, my permanent teaching job at OU. Um, and so I'm, I stay in this area, but I travel a lot for conferences. I present at conferences or I attend conferences. And that's kind of nice because I get to go on like a vacation with my friends from other states who, who do the same thing I do. And I can talk about what I do and they share my frustrations and my joys. And so that's kind of a fun aspect of the traveling there. But then the final option for traveling is there's actually positions called traveling medical laboratory scientists. And this is probably very similar to the dentistry where um, these laboratorians will take like a 13 week contract um, somewhere in the country. It might be Reno, Nevada. It might be Minot, North Dakota. And they kind of fill in for staffing shortages. So they actually work for a staffing agency who places them in a job somewhere for 13 weeks. And then when that contract is up, they place them somewhere else. And so I've had friends who have done that and they've just really enjoyed it because they've been all over the place. I had a friend who went to Wyoming, a friend who went to North Dakota, um, Nevada, South Carolina, North Carolina. And so, so they really enjoy that because they get to see the country. They get to get a lot of experience in a lot of different laboratory environments very quickly too. Yep, I would support again what everything that Stephanie has said. In my current position, I don't travel as much as I used to. Um, again, I you know attend conferences, et cetera, and additional trainings as needed. I used to work for the American Red Cross and I was the liaison between the hospitals and the Red Cross, their blood banks. Um, mm -hmm and you know, the, the blood supply that they had on hand, et cetera, et cetera. So I did local travel at that point in time um, where they would be day trips or if I went way up north, I might be overnight for a night or two. But you can get into marketing sales and equipment repairing and stuff like that and travel as much as you want to. And do you think that there's enough diversity in your field, like just gender, race, et cetera? It's an interesting question from a medical laboratory science perspective. We're very heavily female, um, very, very high majority female um, because a lot of people don't in the, in the general public don't know that our profession exists, right? I mean, most people don't really, our, our success is when people don't know that we haven't, right? Your blood goes to the lab and you got a result back. People only think about us when something goes wrong. A lot of people who are in this field are, are very similar um, to Mrs. Lenneman's, I think, said her parents were in the field. And, and there are, there's a lot of people in our field whose parents were in the field, um, which has sort of limited the diversity just because there's not a, a great widespread way to share who we are and what we do with the general public. It's sort of this, you know, a lot of people had inside knowledge of the career and that's how they ended up in it. Dentistry is something interesting. Um, probably you guys all think that lots of women are dentists because all of a sudden we are. Um, the, the year that I graduated from dental school, um, which was 1993, um, we were the first class in the United States ever that had more women than men in our graduating class. It was like a huge deal because it just, we flipped and 10 years before that, there weren't very many women going into, which kind of boggles my mind. Um, and now there's more women um, than men. It's, 
dentistry is becoming a lot more diverse. Um, it needs to be more diverse and it needs to be more who are the business owners and like the bosses in it. Um, but we're getting there pretty fast. I think with like the sciences and um, healthcare tend to be a little bit more diverse. But I think one thing is that um, there's a lot of schooling and it, you take on a lot of debt getting through dental school. You, you know, same with medical school, but it's, it's more debt than, de than uh, medical school and that um, puts some people off. You know, that creates a barrier. I would agree with what Stephanie has said. Um, medical laboratory science is more predominantly female, although I would have to say over my 40 years in working at it, it has become more diverse and even more males in it. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's coming. I think when healthcare in general tends to be a lot more females, just, I don't know if it's the caretaking role or what it is. If you sort of look back 40 years ago, you know, um, nursing, et cetera, those, when you thought of a career, you th either thought of as a female, you thought of being a teacher or you thought of being a nurse. Mm -hmm. And that were, those are about your only thoughts and options. So I think healthcare does tend to be in general, more female oriented, but I think we're seeing that change. We're seeing more, more males and um, more minorities for sure. Was it, was it hard at all? Like being like a um, woman in science or like going in that career field? I might have a different perspective on this because of age, but I would say for me, not really. Um, really throughout my entire life, I've, I've been exposed to this idea of women in science. It's been a big promotion throughout my educational career. Um, when I was actually in grade school, I was part of an engineering competition called Future City. Um, I don't know if that's still- It was too. Sorry, oh yeah. Random. So, so my school actually won the Michigan region twice and we went to Washington DC to present. And one year we were featured because we were an all female team in this engineering competition. And so we were featured for women in engineering. And so that I was never really exposed to the idea that I couldn't succeed because I was a woman. And I think that's a, a unique thing that's happened in, in recent time. And so for me, I did not experience that. But I do have coworkers who, who share with me their experiences that they have struggled with that in some ways. Yeah, I think because I grew up in a family where my dad was a professor, a science professor, and I was always at the university with him. Um, university settings tend to be more um, women in science, you see them. So I never thought otherwise. Um, the big thing is don't ever let anyone make you feel like you do not belong somewhere and don't ever don't do something because you don't look like everyone else who is there because things can change so quickly and you might be the person who starts the change. So just whatever you want to do, if everyone doesn't look like you, who cares? Go in there and do it anyway. Good advice. Yes. Um, I, I would say Obviously, I'm the oldest of the group, and I've been in the profession for, you know, 40-some years. I, again, was fortunate. My parents were not in, um, they, they weren't in medical laboratory science, but both my parents, who were Depression-era parents and graduated from college at the beginning of World War II, my mom was a chemistry major. Um, in college, actually had the opportunity to go to college. She went on a full ride scholarship and had to keep a three five or better in chemistry in order to keep her scholarship. And my dad happened to be an engineer. So I was raised by them who, and I had four older siblings. So I was never raised with the idea that as a female, I couldn't do anything. I was just part of the family. But I will tell you, as I got out into society, I ran into some of those barriers. I was, I was definitely discriminated against in a job at one point in time where the male told me who was doing the hiring and firing that I should be, I had just had a child six months before that, that I should be home with my child and not, um, not trying to, you know, get this particular management job. Well, I, I did complain to HR about it, which at that point in time didn't get me anywhere. And um, I'll tell you, they made the wrong choice, choice. And within six months, I had a job anyways, because I was the best fit for it. What can you say? Good for you. That's awesome. I think definitely a lot of it now um, even though there are so many like encouraging like just groups started by students themselves but especially I'm in robotics and I definitely feel there is like um, 
a stigma, a little bit of like sexism, just like not by I think the robotics competition people themselves, but about like the students just like on the team. Like there's definitely um a lot of discouragement, I think, for females just on the student student level. So I hopefully that'll change, but I know that has discouraged a lot of people too. Yep. Don't let it discourage you. I know when I graduated, I had a friend who went into engineering, one of the very few engineers. And even today, if you were a female engineer, you know, you'd have the world by its tail because, you know, people would be extremely interested in having you work for them. Women, you know, women and men are not the same. We're different and we all bring different things to the table. So don't, don't let them, don't let them uh, discourage you just because you're female. You got to yeah. break that barrier. Yeah. And just because like one place, like sometimes like um, it, just talking about this with some engineers, um, how like some smaller engineering companies and smaller manufacturers are still kind of like eh, very much against like women and minorities and they, they kind of holding more to the old views. I, you guys probably won't experience that quite so much because things are changing very rapidly thankfully in our society now, but you go to a big corporation like General Motors, they're making the effort to like do better and they are doing way better. So if you ever end up in any field and you're like, this isn't working where you are, get up and move. It's not that you're in the wrong field. You're just in the wrong little niche in that field. Go somewhere else. Please go find someone who will value you. Don't put up with that crap. <laughs> Thank you all so much for giving your time to us today to let us interview you. Yeah, thank you so much. It was super interesting to hear about all you guys. And it was. I'm so glad that all of us are like women and we can talk about the yeah. women in science. <laughs> That's real power. Yeah, absolutely. You know, seriously, you guys, I mean, your generation is amazing. I know everyone gives you guys all kinds of crap, but you guys are amazing and you're going to save the world. So, you know, go out there and do whatever seems like the right thing to you. And don't listen to someone telling you what you should do. Do what you feel in your heart is the right thing to do. And you'll have an amazing life and your job will be one part of it.